So the habit is this. Let's say you your client wants to develop a Facebook application. Right? Okay. And it's giving the requirements based on that. Okay. Your tendency when your when the customer says I want Facebook requirements is for you to imagine Facebook itself. Yeah. And then you start thinking, okay, it will be at the right side corner. You will put friends here. So you are explaining, you are thinking in that line of how to put the this requirement also according to the Facebook data, right? Or Facebook situation. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So that this habit of that, for example, for all you know, the customer is not even asking you to develop it in the web application, right? He is not told you anything. Yeah. He just told that it's a it's a Facebook kind of application. He started imagining that it will be web application. So this tendency of out thinking customer in terms of what he needs. Sometimes is beneficial, sometimes is not beneficial. Especially if you pre-decide and define what your developers or designers have to do, you are more or less saying that this particular uh, list of comments or list of micro statuses that the people are putting or people are uploading have to come in the middle of the screen. That's the yes. design. Are you writing requirements or are you doing design? So that's the kind of problem that you should avoid. You should never try to design how the application, what the application behavior. Sometimes you might say there should be a button of this nature. You should simply talk about actions that the user should do. Why should you talk about button? Why should you talk about uh, upload feature? If you simply say okay. the user should be able to upload, you don't have to say that no, it browse, the browser will come up, you select the so things which are technical in nature, you should not make decisions with the requirement of. Okay. You should only convey the requirement that the user has in the requirement. Okay. What about other people? Other people are very, very clear, is it? Sir, if anyone else to ask you a question, can I ask you one more? You go ahead, yeah. Please keep shooting. <laughs> okay. Uh, in phase three, they say request for proposal. Uh, request for proposal. Now, how, uh, like, I didn't really get that. Like, it's in phase three. That is a request of proposal. I didn't really get a like clear idea of what a BA role is. It says coordination, statement of work, estimation, but I didn't really get an idea. Could you just give a like a highlight on what that role is? You know, the BA role in the request of page proposal. Page three. Uh, page eleven. Page eleven. Okay. You want to ask someone to give a proposal. Right? Yeah. What would you give to the proposal? Sir, near you, come again. What would you give to the other person to give you a proposal? Mm. You have to give something to them, no? To be able to quote the proposal. You yeah. go to architect, a building architect. How yeah. would you go and tell them? For you to give a quote to you, you have to tell them that I need a house. Yeah, Is that enough? No. You you would say floor space, the land you have, how much uh, uh how many rooms you want, what what is that all about? It's your requirements, right? Yeah, all your requirements and expectations and stuff, yeah. That's all your question your answer is for someone who requests for proposal. You my requirement. And yeah. who designs the requirement, who is the right requirement? Right? Your job is to write the requirement and ask the other person to look at the requirement and give a quotation. 
Okay. That person has understood or not understood, you need to ensure that you discuss with them, explain them what you are expecting. Okay. Okay. Yes. Anything Okay, I, I want to ask others, you know, have you seen this teaching inside or it was difficult or you could not do it? Okay, I'm going to ask others. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you. Uh, there is no issue if you are not seated. I just want to know whether you are seated or not. I just said the chance to because I got it like, much later. Okay. What about others? Okay. I had to pack, so I couldn't really look at the side. Okay. No issues. Just go through that. I think they are fairly okay to understand. They are very highly PD intensive. To go through that, if you have any questions, uh, I think it is important that we discuss them and you have a good understanding of what they are because there will be questions. You might have to answer some of these things as your interview questions, so better to have some idea about it. Okay, so let's move to the next one. What is somebody giving a reminder at this point in time? Where are the guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just look at these questions here. Try to think about these questions. Try to see if you can answer these questions. So my question to all of you is, who and what influenced the choice of SDLC in a project? So I think the major factor is the type of project, uh, type of project which we are getting, yeah. which and the customer. If the if the customer wants to uh, wants to be involved in the whole project, then we can we have to take the agile one. But the customer if the customer just want to be uh, in a tradition in a traditional manner, he just want to give the requirements and then he just want to take, see the delivery. Uh, then we can take the waterfall uh, method. I think that is one of the factors. So, in your, in your decision matrix, you are saying there is a customer decision and there is requirement decision. Is that what you are saying? The customer, so the first factor is the cust how much the customer the client want to get involved. If the client uh, wants to wants to be involved in each and every step, then we have to take the agile one, agile method. And if uh, if but in case if the a client wants to just give the requirement and and at the and and don't want to uh, he and he doesn't want to get involved in the whole process and just want to see the the uh, the, the the delivery part, then we can take the waterfall method. You have read too much about customer investment. Yes. <laughs> Sorry? Too much about customer If you say I have time, I will bless you, you will say I will take it back. In case, no, 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 I will not bless you, I will give you a gift, you will go ahead and do the requirement, you will say I will do it. What is that what you are saying? I don't. I am trying to be right right unpolite, so please don't uh, take it negatively. I am trying to be. Questioning your thoughts, that's all it is. Okay? And I'm trying to see if I'm going to be interviewing you, what would I ask you? That's all I'm doing. Actually, I didn't understand what you were saying. <laughs> that is what right. What I say is, for you, customer is king, you know, that seems to be your motto. If yeah. customer says, customer, the God says, I will give you a requirement, please take it and develop, you will do a hot report. Customer says, I will not give you a requirement, I will discuss with you every day, you will do a child. Is that what you are saying? No. 
So I'm saying that, <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> it, it's like that. It's let me let me put the question differently. Okay. Let me say remove the very remove the parameter of customer. Okay. okay. How will you decide? So the intensity of the project. If the project is small, we can probably we can if we, if the developer can manage, then he can. And if the project is like an agile, we have to uh, agile method. There is a lot of requirements, and then we select the uh, that required ones because there are a lot of them. So we select the appropriate, and then we work on it. So okay, I so think that basically you're saying there are only two families for you. Either it's agile family or there is a waterfall family. In between, there are two you. to use this fellow called incremental and iterative they are not required for you no no sir they are required i have given you <laughs> no no i want you to tell me how you will select as dlc that's all i want to know so i think it's depending on the uh, certainty level or you know how to spot the problem see when uh, if there's uncertainty that is a jacob jacob there is a theoretical answer yeah Yeah, so I don't want you to tell me. Tell me how you will determine what is certainty. How will you know what is certain and what is not certain? That we I guess we supposed to figure out when uh, the client talks about it, or like you know when he when he's uh, when he comes uh, comes up to the uh, to the BA without uh, how do you say when you know that he's un unsure, you know when he are you are you are you talking about clarity or are you talking about certainty? So I think it's more about expectation from the client. If 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 the client want to no guys, I am telling you to remove the client part. Remove the client parameter. Don't even think about client. Okay. See, at the end of the day, the project. I agree. If the client says there is nothing you can do, right? Okay. Client says this is how you should do. Nothing can be done. Yes. Okay. But if the choice is yours, how will you make the decision? I probably say. See the type of project and how big is the project. Ah, tell me what is the what do you mean by type of project? Uh, I think I think Jacob is also trying to say the same thing, right? How do you determine what is the type of project? Complexity. Complexity. Okay. Clear. Okay. okay. Exactly. Kind of. So basically, complexity, clarity. Okay. And Jacob also used some word called certainty, complexity, clarity, and certainty. Any more keys for you? And the number of requirements. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, number of requirements. So that was who 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 said that? You know, that was very funny. So immediately one one answer to statement and immediately saying I don't know. <laughs> I mean I will I will I'm just thinking in my head as a BA if the requirements are very much. Guys, you know don't don't worry you know don't be don't 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 feel uh, don't feel uh, anxious about what you are saying. Go ahead and say that. The idea is that we we clear our head here, right? That's the idea of what I'm doing. But requirements come at a later stage. Ah, uh, possibly no. Requ you see, unless you know, uh, unless you know requirements, you can't really make an SDLC decision, mm -hmm. right? There are situations where companies say you have to do everything in agile because we believe in agile, right? That's what we do in our India, right? So our marriage is your your perform our marriage only this way, right? Yes, sir. So our traditions are like that, right? So we do our tradition this way. Why do we do our, our tradition that way? Nobody knows, but we have to do this way. So some places there is no logic. When there is no logic, they cover it by saying it's our tradition, right? So you will go into some companies. You will say, in our company, we follow only iterative process. We are great about it. As if you know, when you do idea for iterative projects, you know, you never fail. They talk like that. So I think. The choice is, guys. That is where your thinking needs to be very clear. I think the three C's that you said is definitely correct, right? Yes. Sir. But, but 
how do you how do you answer this question if someone asks you this question will you say these three 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 these three trees are what do you mean by these three trees you know it should be more complex for if it is complex what will you do will you choose waterfall or will you choose a jail or will you choose iterate what is that you are trying to tell me unfortunately for us there are four hdlc models there is no one not what one or two so how will you make the choice you got the problem now yeah how will you make the choice come on some more debate guys don't throw the towel no more question just thinking hmm. amukta you are able to hear okay so now here goes the thought process right so no, one 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 thought yeah yeah so it can be uh, the decision can be moved from the cost benefit i mean analysis i mean we can when we get the project we can analyze what are the benefits what is the cost and what what uh, at <laughs> which level if we make mistake then what can be the uh, repercussions of that or what can be the result is it very this yes, nda 2014 talking this yes, nda 2014 <laughs> the right question is you are right yaar so i have no problem with what you are saying but how will you know how will you find that data so that you have to get us <laughs> <laughs> no i also don't know i want to know i want to know from you see all you said is fine i have no problem with what you are saying my problem is how will you make the choice of this four if it is true i have understanding clearly Yeah. let us say you say if this is high this is medium high this is low i do this i am more comfortable with that statement you got what i'm saying yeah highly complex i want to go to agile medium complex i want to go to uh either iterative or incremental the customer need faster roi i might go to incremental mm-hmm. and i have a bigger question to you are these mutually exclusive processes you understand what is the meaning of mutually exclusive right yeah can i combine incrementalism into agile you got what i'm saying Okay, so let's take these examples, right? So, if you have to give, or if you want to make a good decision about SDLC, the foremost aspect is what is the level of clarity you have on the requirements. The greater the clarity, the greater the chances of you not involving customer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The greater the clarity, the greater the chances of that you don't have to involve customers. So you have not still made a decision, right? The second thing: what is the mechanism in which the customer wants to realize the benefit of your solution? Do they want a big bang approach of delivering everything? or do they want a incrementalist approach of delivery three i call this as involvement 
what is the level of involvement that a customer would want a lot of customers are finicky mm-hmm. they say it is highly domain oriented and in most of the cases we also say the same as vendors saying that if this is high dom- highly high domain i am a technologist i am not your domain specialist so we need someone to monitor and work with us to be able to deliver a proper solution so what is the level of domain knowledge that is needed in a project what is the level of l- rules that we need in the project what is the amount of governmental or third party knowledge that we need to have so we are assessing all these things based on this assessment you take a call a medium complex iterative delivery or incremental delivery makes sense high complex that means requirement clarity is minimum basically average and highly complex very very heavily rule driven it's not easy for people to understand those rules you have to involve the customer so you would typically go for agile where you are involved in the customer every day if the customer says i cannot my involvement cannot be high then you go into next best option is incremental model where you are delivering some piece of work and ask him to review quickly so the decision is based on these factors of complexity of requirement clarity of the requirement even if it is complex but it's very clear to me not big issue so complexity of requirement clarity of requirement customer involvement right and lastly the culture of organization there are customer cultures if the customer has got low maturity right low maturity of it your agile will fail because they don't know what to do in agile if the customer has got high maturity anything can pass all the things can pass so maturity here is about does the customer know what is the impact of his involvement in the project where exactly he should involve for example if the customer gets involved i involvement but he is getting into micro level details potentially your team members are getting demotivated and they may not deliver well so heavy customer involvement and light customer involvement both probably are dangerous so the balance need to be struck so there is no easy answer to the choice of sdlc model but a thumb rule kind of aspect is higher complexity greater willingness of customer reasonable or medium level clarity of requirements you would go with a jail higher complexity reasonable amount of clarity less involvement of customer you will go with incremental the greater the clarity medium complexity lower to medium level involvement of customer you go to the other two it is incremental or waterfall model waterfall model you will always go if you have maximum clarity do you have enough time to have that clarity plus there are any if there are any specific conditionalities that you should not be involving customer at all you might go for the waterfall model okay yeah. at least some part yeah is one who was that some question was asked me rishma your voice is extremely low rishma 
you need to talk little closer to your mic or you need to talk to the mic Hello. Yeah, Krishna. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, could you please repeat those ones? Like the. I should repeat clarity. what. Yeah. yeah. See. See what happens when you have lot of clarity about requirement. Mm -hmm. You have high clarity of requirement. That means you are capable of delivering, right? Yeah. yeah. That means you don't need anybody else's help. So, for example, you have been doing this project, this kind of work regularly. Do we need anybody's help? You are expert yourself, right? When you are yeah. really great experts, you don't need their their help. You can deploy it any which way, right? Yeah. You will see a lot of this consulting or product companies. If you know, there used to be a famous company called I2 Technology. they were so certain about their algorithm about supply chain optimization and efficiency that they went about being the company in logistics one failure with reebok or nike i think i think them hit them so badly that the whole company went into doldrum so sometimes you can take this high stake strategy of i will know your problem and i will solve your problem or in which case you probably are the domain expert you are the best in that industry and you are trying to solve the problem so if the domain knowledge clarity is something that you are thought leader i think implementing that in in terms of any model is okay high level of clarity of requirements legality issues you tend to go towards the waterfall model medium level complex you tend to go to waterfall model medium to high level complexity you trend move towards iterative model because you want to you want a customer to satisfy himself and then say okay this is what i am expecting when the clarity is coming down you go towards you shift towards more customer participation which is incremental if the clarity is very low you go if you further shift towards agile you understood yes yeah. and the level of involvement is higher on the agile side as compared to waterfall model so if the customer is also willing to give you that means low clarity as well as high involvement it is definite choice of agile okay. so this next question is how was how would a customer impact your work how did customer impact your work we just discussed that according to the customer in uh, the project complex uh, compl complexity and the customer involvement are the factors which which de determine which procedure which process you do so customer is the one who who as you said customer is the king so as the customer same uh, the work is done like that so that they are satisfied yeah so i think i'm one of the person i think amusta says uh if the customer keeps changing his requirement that means the level of maturity of the customer is low it can impact your work really badly so see customer has different styles of operation right that customer who simply love you and they want to help you and all that stuff and there are situations where customers are absolutely difficult to manage they'll make your life miserable 
They say, I am paying so much for you, you better give me the results. I don't care when, what you do and how you do. At the end of the day, I want to see results. So the customers can be of different kinds of people. Basically, this question is about their involvement. They might, where they need to be involved, they don't get involved. And where they don't need to be involved, if they get involved, your life is difficult and your project will be difficult. So, unreasonable expectations is another part where the customer can make your life difficult. So, managing their expectations and managing their involvement are the key to ensure that a good customer relationship as well as good customer projects can be executed. So, how would he impact? A, he can make he is not certain what he wants. He brings a lot of non-clarity. Two, he can be micro-involving himself in everything. So recently there was a case where uh, a customer was working with us. But that customer's habit of pushing that person's idea, overriding, ignoring the technical team's inputs, getting into almost every decision level even though the person did not know much about technology, had made the life of many developers miserable. So these guys lost motivation to work and then they ended up delivering bad solutions. This made the customer becoming even more control oriented and started becoming even more micro level control. That resulted in further slide in the conference of the people. So over a period of time, it has come to a pass where they were silently hating each other. One fine day, that person said she can no longer, that this is the customer said, uh, customer said that she can no longer work with this team. The customer's boss called us and said, guys, uh, there seems to be a problem. The, my person is saying that they cannot work with certain people in your team. Then our people said, we can't work for this, for this person any longer. Their problem is, you need to let us do our job. If you are going to sit on the back, back side, you do back, drop back, uh, back seat driving or rear view mirror driving, and after that, if things go crazy, if you say that I was responsible, I cannot accept it. So customer, and then ultimately what happened, both of them lost jobs. So customer can impact you that badly. They can be so micromanaging that, you know, you feel all your freedom is gone, all your creativity and then your work, motivation is gone. Right? So, Customer can be very, very formal, very, very finicky, very, very panicky. All of them are not good. They need to be balanced enough. So that balance would come from maturity. For example, large organizations bring a lot of maturity in their processes. So that's why that helps in stabilization. Is that clear? Okay, so what I suggest is, can you guys read these two things? What is continuous testing and what is test-driven development? And what is SOA, Web 2.0, Enterprise 2.0, Cloud Computing all about? Can you guys read this? No, sir. I do not read about it. Can you read it tomorrow, day after, during next weekend? Yeah. Yeah, so... I know that most of you are not our technical guys, so it will be helpful if you start reading this stuff. So read this stuff. Next, maybe next Monday, Tuesday, we can discuss about it. If you have any questions, but you have a couple of before you can you can say your things. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at. You guys know that you will be talking to developers, isn't it? If you look at. You know, important stakeholders, developers are one important stakeholder, and other side is customer, right? Customer and developers are your probably the most important stakeholders. 
So before we go to the customer stakeholders, we need to also have a, we need to also manage the developer stakeholders. Is it or should we not? Right? Is it all the manage all the developer stakeholders? Could you repeat the question again here? Should we care for developers? Yeah, I think so, yeah. He's the one who will be... I think I'll develop the solution. Yeah. Alright, alright. Absolutely right. So, when you have conversation, that means you need to have conversations with them? Yes. So when you have conversations, should the conversation should be more like I tell you, you listen, or you want to have conversation where both of you share and care for each other? Dialogue, so yeah. Sharing, knowledge. Sharing. So basically you will talk requirement language and even talk technical language. Should it be listening and understanding him or you don't have to like, understand that? That should be an understanding, sir. So well, that means you need to have a little bit of understanding of what he's saying. Because, yes. you know, right, people tend to speak in their language. Yes. So, uh, you will often hear uh, uh, people who play football, you know, talk in football language, people who play cricket, talk in cricket language, people who are having professions, uh, Let's say all the IT folks, right? If you get up in the morning, uh, the IT folks call, and I am rebooting my son. What is rebooting my son? I'm, re I'm kick starting my operating system again so that it will have memory and I'll start talking like I am ready. So, this reboot word is some kind of an IT folk uh, language. Right? Uh, if you go to the finance guy, you might say I'm kicking my market up. So, he's talking in his own language. So this tradition of speaking in my own my own profession is pretty high, isn't it? Have you seen such people who talk their profession in their life? Not on life? Have you or not? So if you see chat chat, right, when you people people chat in the, in, the, in, the, in the chat rooms, they abbreviate see here, and uh, they use various words, right, so there is meaning to that, that they know, uh, lol, lol, lots of laughs, so I don't know, these are all the words that people use, which become part of their vocabulary because they tend to use it. The automobile com company guy will say that I'm starting my engine in the morning. So they tend to speak their language. Our developer folks are no immune to this process. So when you go to them and sit there and they say, Hey, uh, Grishma, I'm trying to, this object is not really getting handle on me. I'm not able to really put a handle on this object. I don't understand how the operation is working. You start talking this language. Should you be comfortable listening to that kind of language and should you be not making some sense out of such language? Yes or no? Yes, right? You have to be. Yeah, you have to make sense out of it. So, so if you have to make sense out of that, We need to learn a little bit about what is this software engineering, object-oriented engineering, service-oriented engineering, and the kind of language that these orientations or paradigms would bring. So the next few minutes, we will be discussing about the aspects of what developers talk and how technically it becomes important in, in an IT jobs. There are essentially three paradigms. A procedural paradigm, an object orientation paradigm, and a service oriented paradigm. Service oriented is basically an extension case of object orientation. 
That's why I should put there two, but I realized lately that better to think like three rather than two. So if somebody asks you to explain how you went to your supermarket, or somebody attempt that, can you explain how you go to supermarket? How do you go to supermarket? Is anybody willing to explain? So we basically uh, make a list, then think of okay. going. And we mm -hmm. go to our car, start it, go, buy stuff, come back. Right. So if you have to go tomorrow, what will you do? Today I'll make a grocery list. Again, you will make it, right? I mean, again you will make it. Again, you will make a grocery list. You will again go in the car. You will again go to shop. Yeah. We'll come back. Yes. One day later, we will again do the same thing. Yes. Right? Yes, sir. So that is nothing but procedure, right? Yes. This is a procedure. Procedure language exactly the same kind of process. Even though I did yesterday something, I cannot reuse it. I have to create a fresh list. I go and then do it again. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So procedural is nothing but following steps in an orderly fashion, right? Uh, yes, sir. So the software engineering originally used to be procedural. That means I follow steps. Okay. Over the period, the IT folks have started seeing that the mechanical industry, especially the car industry, makes things in Nut and bolt fashion or in assembly fashion. If I say assembly, I'm manufacturing things to specification and I assemble them together. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, so they said, why not I do the same thing in software engineering? I will save a lot of work. For example, if daily I'm preparing lists, why should I prepare daily list? I'll create one full list and then daily I might select from that and then go for whatever I lack, whatever I might have to purchase for a day. Yes. Right? Yes. So people started seeing how do I optimize my amount of effort? How do I optimize my cost by reducing the amount of Space right, so procedural is focus of steps. Yes. What is object oriented there? The object oriented is more like a noun and a verb doing something. To each other. What does that mean? It means objects I see in object oriented programming, objects interacting with each other. The focus has now shifted from steps that are being performed to the actors that are there and what they are discussing or what they are messaging with each other. You understood what I am saying? Is there some strategy that you point out of what I discussed or still very, very cloudy? So could I explain the object oriented paradigm a little once more? Sorry. Yeah, so I, I'll further explain. That's not a, we'll have some more examples of that. Okay. So object oriented is about, they call it a plug and play. Have you heard about this word called plug and play? So what play? Plug and play. I don't hear you. Plug, plug, B -L -U -G, plug and play. 
it's called plug and play yeah so there is plug and play model it essentially means that for example your tape recorder or your 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 mobile phone this you plug in charge it and you play it right so let's plug and play yeah so the procedural focus has been steps i do this step after that i do this step it's a sequence of steps the object oriented is about the main actors and what messages they transfer between each other right so the other way of describing your steps Nifty, you are you are you are the one, or I don't know, Pallavi, one of you have spoken last time, explaining the the grocery store procedure, right? Yes, sir. If if I tell you that you identify what are the objects or what are the nouns in this particular scenario, what are the nouns in this scenario? One is yourself, other one is the list object, a third one is your shop right there are three nouns here is that correct mm -hmm. so each noun if you consider them as objects and one object talks to another object through messages is the focus no steps or is the focus in terms of which two individuals are talking at any at any point in time what the focus here is the focus steps or the focus is one body messaging to another body objects are a physical or virtual objects in this in the session what is happening i the teacher object is discussing with the student object how are we discussing the discussion is something about messages from me that is reaching you and messages from me you that is reaching me so there are messages between us right and there is two human objects student and teacher correct so the focus here is not the steps that i follow but the focus is which are the two objects are interacting towards achieving the goal so object oriented is about thinking in terms of objects and trying to see how the messages are being transmitted between these objects is that clear is what i said clear guys and it's a partial yeah look at this as an example just review this a minute and tell me what you observe here and let's review this for a minute and tell me what you observe Anybody wants to volunteer? And what do you also? The accounting transaction, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, banking. Oh, let's see it. Okay, I understood that. So between the two things, what do you observe? The uh, two diagrams in the same thing. What do you observe? one is integrated the other one is not i think i'm not sure <laughs> okay let's let's look at this one here right what is that it is doing main 
That means I'm starting. After I start, I want to perform transaction. Mm -hmm. I will do compute interest. It's repeating the same thing. If checking, then do this. If filing, then do this. Compute fees. It's doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So what is happening here? It is. See this logic here. It's more or less using the same logic. That means this one I'll repeat for savings account separately. For example, if I do compute interest for checking account, I will do one. For saving account, I will do one. Another process. Here also for compute fee. For checking account, I will do one one procedure. For saving account, I will do one procedure. Now watch what I am doing here. What am I doing? I'm saying checking account, compute interest is one method. Compute fees is another method. Savings account, compute interest, compute fee. What's the difference here? Did you notice? Here the checking comes in the logic. The noun comes in the logic. The verb runs the logic. The verb runs the noun. Here noun runs the verb. Did you see that first? Yeah. The question that you need to ask is, should we follow the procedure? Or should the humans do the procedure? When the procedure run the human, a human run the procedure. What is right? What's the right thing, guys? Should the procedure run the humans or should the human run the procedure? Human run the procedure. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> So when you go to the airport, right, first time you go, would you, would the human run to you or would the procedure run to you? So there are occasions, maybe less of a where the procedure, you need to be guided. The procedure needs to tell you how to do it. So if you notice, Wherever you do, whatever you do, the first time if you try something, you will be efficient in that. Right? Then you want to try to create a procedure that keeps repeating itself. You create a procedure to make sure that you are able to repeat the process every time. Is that clear? The procedure is meant to make sure that you become more and more correct and accurate. Yeah. Whereas if the focus is shifted towards from procedure to people, people mentality or this optics mentality is to optimize. So if you see the diagram here, the first section is saying perform transaction, compute fee, if there is do this. That means I'm repeating the same. I would compute the fee the same way for savings account where the values will differ. I would compute the fee for the, the checking account, the values might be different. But the way I do calculation will be the same, right? Let's say if I have to do percentage calculation, I take the value, value 1 divided by the total value into 100 in a percentage. It doesn't matter where I put the percentage, whether I calculate percentage for savings, or whether I cancel percentage for checking, the way I do the calculation is same. Correct? Yes or no? If I move towards the other side, if I ask each of you to do calculation, each of you will do this the same way? Each of you will do the same calculation? The percentage calculation is the same way, or will you do different things? Obviously, you will do it the same way. That means, if I get a formula to the system, I can reuse the formula in many places. Correct? If a percentage formula is known to each of you, you will compute the percentage formula the same way. If I know that this is the right way to use it, 
or right way to do if a somebody has programmed that why should i repeat the program again somewhere else why can't i just take it and then use it everywhere which is more efficient by repeating it everywhere or create one good one and reuse that everywhere you understanding what i said okay so the reuse part is what we try to bring that means we are trying to move from the first time usage which is procedural usage to more optimal reuse usage all right so an object oriented world is converting to cost shifted from the process steps to now doing the process steps to try to reuse the code that you develop for one place in context other similar context that's what we are doing in the object oriented mechanism in if you look at one thing and closely the focus is verb the verb is doing things and if you see this one here the noun is doing things is that clear at least that english language level you are clear right Let's get our guys. Clear or clear? So essentially, what we are doing is our earlier method was procedural oriented. Remember, every time when you do new thing, you will try to be careful about what you should do. to do it right so the procedure oriented comes at the beginning as you start experience of the procedure you will try to see where exactly the process can reuse what you can reuse you will start thinking about it that means you are optimizing it so optimization tells you that this is how you should do so object orientation is about optimizing it so once i learn something i transfer that learning to someone else they will reuse he will transfer the knowledge to someone else they will reuse so this is about the object orientation has come from the fact that if i did one procedure nicely or one 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 formula nicely everybody will use it for same formula then they are not repeating it again therefore there is a reuse so that is the reuse of expertise second thing is if there is a certain thing that works would you try to risk something that might fail all of you would have gone for some coaching for your exams coaching for your competitive exams would you go or no yes sir so why did that happen because you know that there there are colleges and there are institutions that advertise that they have standard design and algorithms to make somebody average into brilliant would they do that Would they say that they can convert somebody who is average into brilliant? They won't say that. They simply say, "I have standard designs and algorithms, and some of my past students are being toppers." That's what they tell, right? Yeah. But we believe that they made some toppers. Therefore, they should also make me top topper. That's what our belief is, and we go there. Get it? In a way, you are believing this statement called. as reuse of standard designs and algorithms so they know how to design their course work and therefore they know algorithm of how to make sure it gets into my head and therefore i feel comfortable with them because they prove it somewhere since they prove somewhere they should be able to do this for me as well so reuse of standard design algorithm reuse of standard procedures and process and so what does it mean A lot of you know that Excel is a spreadsheet application is a great place where you can do mathematical and financial functions. If I want to use the same thing everywhere else, I should be able to simply use the library, right? I just use the Excel library and use the formula formulas everywhere else in my programs. So that's what I can do. 
So I can create framework and I can reuse it. I can create complete application service and reuse the same application service in multiple places. There are many ways that you can use it. So now let's go into the next step, which is called objects and classes. What is an object and what is a class? My famous example for this is so Jacob, do you have a car? Uh, no, sir, bike. What bike you have? Yamaha LZ. Is it yours or is it your friend's? Uh, it's mine. The Yamaha LZ is mine. I thought it's Yamaha, this is Yamaha, Yamaha's bike, not your bike. It's not Yamaha's bike? I own it, I paid for it, so I own it. But the brand hey, is Yamaha. Own, so. Ownership is different from, is ownership equivalent to saying it's my bike? If you own it, you can say it's your bike, right? That's what I thought. And what happens if your friend is driving it, what will happen? What will he call it as? If your friend met me with that bike and he's riding that bike, would he not say that he's riding it faster than he's riding his bike faster than me? I didn't get your question, sir. Are you saying that uh, if my friend rides the bike? If, if, if your friend has taken your bike on mm -hmm. these are on loan from you mm -hmm. and he's riding, would he call it as his bike at that point in time or will it cause hey, this is Jacob bike? Get the bike, you will keep telling that to everybody. If he's leaving it for me in the sense that he's paying me money, then it is his bike. No, I no. leaving here doesn't mean he's paying you. Friend never pays. That's what I thought, yeah. If it's, if All friends are coming in, right? They will not pay you. If he's just taking it, then it's still my bike. Okay, that's my bike. That is your view. If, that is if on the road, road, if I see, I see. If I am the road, I see him traveling there, I would call it as your, hey, that is Jacob's bike, I would say that fellow's bike, who is riding it. The guy who is riding it, yeah, you would think it is his bike. It is his bike, right? Yeah. So obviously ownership is not, ownership is not equivalent to your bike. Okay. You feel one you are driving at that point in time is your bike, right? So at least we have we've broken one ground, right? <laughs> the ownership is not equal to your bike. So typical example is also taxi, right? Taxi is not the own, the taxi need not be his own, own taxi. Taxi might be something that he has leased from someone and is riding it. But would he, would he call it as his taxi or would he call it as someone else's taxi? Usually you, whatever you are driving or whatever you are using, you tend to say that is your bike at that point in time. Why did I talk this case about this? There is a reason why I'm doing this. If you go and let's say there is a car. When you say it's a bike, car or bike, what does it mean? A car or a bike, what does it mean? What's a car or a bike? Anybody wants to answer this? It's too difficult to answer this question. Sir, we are all power students, you know, don't ask us mechanical questions. What's a car or a bike, guys? Simple, no? A car or a bike is The common noun, the kind of common noun, right? This car. How if I say the car or a bike? Let's say car. We said Emma, right? When somebody says car or bike, does it mean something to you mentally? Does it mean? Does it convey that a car has got four wheels? It's got. It will have at least a driver. It will have a driving wheel. It will have some seats. It has an engine. Does it convey any of those things to you? Yeah. So car means, if I show you bike and say that this is car, would you accept it? No. 
So that means car has got certain characteristics, and in everybody's mind, car has got characteristics, right? Yeah. Now, if I say BMW, Maruti, all of you know Maruti, right? So, would you see BMW Maruti as same as car, or are they different cars? Cars are at different levels. No, don't worry about levels right now. But they are cars, or they are different cars. Cars or different cars? Any guess, sir? Are they cars, or are they different types of cars? Cars. So they are all cars. That means basic features of car will be there between Maruti and BMW, right? In addition to that, what else will be there between BMW and Maruti that you have to pay different prices for them? Luxury. Okay. So you are adding some more features into this, right? Yeah. So you might maybe Maruti doesn't have AC air conditioner. This is fully blown air conditioner. This is for safety features. Maruti doesn't have safety features. This is for more powerful engine. Maruti is for less powerful engine. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so you have to have that bias. I will solve your problem. BMW Series One S One. BMW S Two. What is this? Is it BMW, right? No, it's different models. No, I didn't get you. What does model mean? It is again different features. Yeah. The difference between these two models is a different set of features. Yeah. Would they have not four cars again, four wheels again? Will they, they, will they not have steering? Will they not have safety features? They will, right? Yeah. So what is the BMW S2 then? Again. They are inheriting the properties of the car. They are inheriting the properties or brand value of car. You would simply say, if BMW, it will be stable vehicle. It will drive fast. It will be speed. Would you say that or? So the BMW attributes are being passed to the next level. Is that it? Would BMW produce a Maruti level car? No. 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 So that means. There are certain characteristics that the BMW transfers to the, the models that it builds. They will be stable. They will be always having those those characteristics. So in a way, do you see some DNA getting passed between all these three? R is the grandfather. Grandfather's features are getting transferred to BMW. BMW adding some more features to that car features, and then transmitting that to the next level, right? Yes or no, guys? Yeah. Somebody has put a question. You know, it looks like reluctant. Yes. Who was that? We did not like. Somebody had a question. Nobody has got a question. Let us say series of things. We have Amstar car and Kandari car. So both have same BMW color. Okay. So let's say BMW series two they bought. So now I will ask you a simple question, guys. Right? Let us say I have a car somewhere here. Right now, name here. What is what do you call this? What do you call this, guys? Imagine this is a car, right? Now there is no name, nothing is there. I don't have. I have not told you anything about this. Will you call it as a car or something else? Yeah, I think. 
So if you don't know what it is, you will call it as paradigm. You will use the highest hierarchy name when you are not certain about what it is. If you know a little bit more, you might call, you might have seen BMW template there, you might say BMW car. If you see S2, you will see a CS2 car. Fortunately, unfortunately, if you know if Pallavi is driving, you will say it's Pallavi's car, right? Okay. Fortunately for Pallavi and unfortunately for us, that she is driving by BMW car, right? Mm -hmm. So, this BMW car, if Pallavi is driving at that point in time, it's Pallavi's car. If Shini has picked up a car from Pallavi and he starts driving, it becomes Shini's car. Although the ownership is different. All other people would see that he is in this car. Especially if I am riding it badly, you will, somebody will shout at me, why are you driving your car badly? It looks like it's my car. Yeah. We are coming to one important concept, okay? We are coming to a situation where I am making a definition and I am going to ask you a question. A class is a common noun. An object is an instance of a class. That means I am using it right now. Right? An instance is nothing but the use. If I am using it now, it is called instance. And only the one which is getting used is called an object. If it is not getting used, it is a if this is Pallavi's car, currently Pallavi is using, that means it's an instance. If Pallavi's car is in garage, it's a class. You got what I'm saying? Not much, right? If Pallavi's car is in use, it's an object. Why it is an object? If you go back to my example, if Pallavi is driving, it's Pallavi's object. If I am driving, it's my object. Right? The, the usage is defining, the usage is defining what is it. Correct? Jacob, you are talking to someone else? Sorry, sorry, I had guessed my bad. Okay. Anyway, so, the usage tells you that it's the usage is actually telling the car. The usage is actually telling you whose car. Yeah. The usage is the key difference between an object and a class. Otherwise, object and class can be used interchangeably. But use the use makes the difference between object and a car and a class. Sorry. A class is unused situation. So if you go to architect, right? If you go into the architect mode, a blueprint, a house blueprint is a class. A house is a object. Are you getting what I'm saying? Is what I'm saying is clear to you? A stationary car is a class. A running car is an object. So if you are not still understood, it's fine. It's just that you need to keep this concept right now in the back of your head. That if something is in use state, it is object. If something is not in a use state, it is a class. If that part of English goes into your head, then it will become more clearer as we proceed. Is this part of English clear to you guys? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's go a little deeper and find out how to make this much more clear, right? We need to make much more clear about this particular part. Okay. So here, this definition is that objects are instances of class, right? That's what that fellow is also saying. A running program can be seen as collection of objects collaborating to perform a given task. We learn a little bit more about this concept, right? So 
So, let's say you write an exam, all of you write an exam, right? You went to the exam and you came back. So, you are asking each other how did you perform in your paper. Was the question paper unique to you or question paper common to everybody? You are all in the same class. Would the question paper be common to everybody else? We need each other. Is it like that? Is uh, a question, uh, when, a, when there's an exam and there's a bundle of question paper, that is a class, and then the, each question paper is given to each person, each student, then suppose if, if a question paper is given to me, then it's a object. Is it like, is it, am I right? Yeah, yeah, you are on the right path. So when it, it then it basically get customized, it, it's called object, otherwise the basic thing is called class. I, I think you are on the right path. A little bit more clarity is needed. So we'll, we'll, I'm working on that path of making that clear to you. Okay. So, okay, so let's take this one. The cash in your pocket. Is it your cash or is it the government cash? My, my cash. Oh? Huh? Because it's in your pocket. Yes, sir. That's all. That? When the cash is the government, it's the class. No, even in your pocket, it's cash. It's, object. it's a class on you, right? Yeah. Okay, now that's confusing. <laughs> No, it's not class. No. I I think it's an object then when you get the uh when the when you get some amount of cash. It's so object. By that stretch of argument, by the stretch of argument, cash is in somebody's pocket anyway, right? So it's always an object. Are you really using your cash when it is in your pocket? Are you really using cash when it is in your pocket? No. No, right? You're not using. Okay. We'll take your own example and say the cash in your pocket is object, right? Okay. What is the say cash in your bank? When Would you exactly identify the cash? The number, the cash, the note number that you have in your pocket, if it were in the bank, would it be the same when you withdraw from the ATM? No, it's not the same. Would it be the same? No, it's not. It's always different. So, what is the difference now? You have a debit card, it is also holding cash. You have cash, which is actually a note in your pocket. What's the difference? It's the same thing, right? Same cash for you. Is it any difference for you? No, it is same for me. So why? Why the, what is the difference in this cash? You get the picture when I try to tell you now. As long as you are not using it, they are they have a holding value, right? Your cash has a holding value. Your the debit card has a holding value. That's all it is, right? And when I say cash, what does it mean? Is it a dollar? Is it a rupee? Is it a euro? What is it? What is it? Can be anything, right? Yes. So, is cash therefore an object? Or cash is a class. 
Did you got why I said it's an up? It's you are on right path, but not right. So cash is a common term. If cash is being exchanged, that is when it is becoming used, and that is when it becomes object. As long as cash is idle, as long as the car is idle, it is a class. The definition of object is when I get used, when I become instantaneous. We will discuss about instant. When I get used. So right now, keep this in mind. Yeah. Okay. No, I got it. So at least this clarity is there right now. Yes. Yeah. Because cash can mean anything to anybody. For example, I am sitting in India. I don't think it's rupees. All of you are sitting in US. You will think it's dollar. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mentally, you have different meaning to it, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There is no clear clarity. But when it is transaction, when you are buying something and you are paying, you are either paying in dollar or you are paying in rupee. It should be very clear to you at that point in time. Correct. Yes. Sir. To make it easier for you, if I use a debit card in a portal. And my debit card is buying me something. If the debit card is buying a dollar, paying a dollar, it ultimately converts into rupee in my account. But I can still pay in dollars. Yes or no? Is my credit card a debit card? I can pay to the customer in euro. Is my credit card a debit card? Correct. Mm -hmm. I can pay in any form. So essentially, you need to understand that till the transaction happens, you really don't know what transaction, what currency I'm going to use, and therefore it is an object only at the time of my transaction. Or otherwise, it's only a class. I, it might be anything, and this is this typically happens. Although my holding is in rupee, right? I'm holding rupees in my bank account. I'm paying to. I am paying to Apple in dollar. Let's say I purchase one app into my iPad. I have to pay three dollars. Amazon asks me three dollars. My card, the card I am paying three dollars. My bank will deduct one eighty rupees. All right. In this transaction, I am using the object called cash. The cash has got three different forms. The form is dollar form for Apple. The form is debit card when I am using on the website, and the form is cash of rupees in my account. All three are happening, right? All three are getting used at this point in time. So therefore, they are objects. Is that clear to you? <laughs> right. So as long as they are concepts. They are classes. You drive them to use. They are objects. So little bit more further clarification I do as we discuss this. Sorry. You guys have any example that you want to share? You see this example here now. You have a car here. Car for me means chassis, four wheels, and steering. Car has Toyota and Ford. Toyota has got different dimensions and different kinds of design. Ford has got different dimensions and design. Toyota has got two types of cars: the Corolla and Camry. They are differing based on engine type and size. They have red and blue car, right? You are able to understand the entire thing. Yeah. So Supreme, the owner, is one car, and when Supreme using it, he say, now I if I use Supreme's car, you might say Supreme's car, or people who know it, or people who don't know they will call it the red car, or people who know me they will call it Chinese car. The same car 
as it's getting used, there are different names to it. People are referring to it with different names. But the reality is that it is getting used, therefore people are calling it. If it recites, if it is recites, you can call anything. You can call it as a Toyota car, you can call it as a Camry car, you can call it as a Blue car, you can, you can call it as a Green car, it can be called anything. But when I'm using it, it tends to be my car. Is that clear? When I'm using it, it's my car. But if I don't use it, I keep it there, it can be, people will call it any of these names. They can call it as a blue car, they can call it as a Camry car, they can call it as a Ford car, as a Florida car, or they can call it as a general car. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. The, the uniqueness that is in my car is coming only when I'm driving. Otherwise, if I left it there, it can be called with any of these names. Do you agree or no? Yes, sir. Ah, that is the reason why it is a class. That means, if I don't know what it is, I will use common names. I will use class name. If I use it, I will call it as my name. So, same thing with your food. You have four pieces of food. If it is in your plate, it is your food. If it is not in your plate, it is in common plate, it is food. My food, food. There is a difference. Isn't it? The same characteristic is changing just because it falls into your plate. Now it becomes your, your food. That means you are getting used. It is getting consumed. Therefore, it is an object. But as long as it is staying in some other basket where nobody is using, it is referred by class. Is that clear? Can you see this example here? Class word. Under class word, you are looking at, let us say I am using Pallavi star, right? We will put Pallavi star. So Pallavi star here, in the class world, Pallavi owns it, Pallavi star. Pallavi star has got staticness to it. Pallavi star will have static properties. What does that mean? Whatever color, everything will be static. It is, it, it is, it will have blue color, it, has, it is a BMW car, all these things are properties attached to Pallavi's car. They are not in use. What is the contextuality of that Pallavi's car? It is currently stationary, it is sitting somewhere, it is in their garage, that is the context of that, right? In the object world, let us say I took Pallavi's car and I started driving it. Now you don't call it as Pallavi's car any longer, you call it a series car. Right? I, all the functions of Pallavi's car also is moving along with me, right? It is not staying with Pallavi's car. They are also coming along with me, isn't it? Yes, sir. The same features are there. Now I am driving it. Right? Would there be speed when Pallavi's car is in the garage? No. Would there be petrol or diesel that is being consumed when the Pallavi's car is sitting in the car in the garage? No. So that means in the class world, the context and static remains the same. If I took Pallavi's car from our garage to my garage to any of your garages, Amokta's garage or Grishma's garage, would it change? Would it become different? Would it have a different color? Would it have different, uh, let's say, tires? Would, it, would it, the wheels change? Would it? No. It remains the same. But the moment I start it and I start driving it, the petrol values are the consumption, because of consumption, the diesel levels are going down. The speeds are varying. Your wheels are rotating at different levels. Your AC is running. There are many factors that are happening. There are many changes that are happening. So in general, a class has only something that is static, cannot be used. Even the context properties are stationary, unused state. But in object world, a static properties continue to be 
I will explain more and more about static properties a little later. But imagine that static properties are carried forward, and a lot of context properties that are dynamic keep changing. So that is what is happening in object world. That means object world, the data values are changing. Let's hear. Yes. So this is the next level concept that you need to understand. Let's go to the third level value. So we will discuss this tomorrow. I think this this this, this topic will this will just keep it this level, and we'll discuss something more from my program. So in general, I think there is this weird concept called plant and object sitting in your head right now. I said in your mind, you are clear that a class is not in use something. If you are using something, you call it an object. At least this concept is sitting in your head. Am I right? Hopefully, I am right. Otherwise, you don't come to me, right? So, the definition you are seeing here. What is object-oriented programming then? If you have objects, object-oriented programming is your ability to use these objects and and your ability to use these objects and make sure that those objects interact and deliver you a service. That's all object-oriented programming. That means I use these objects and I make these objects function for you, work for you. That is the object-oriented programming. Now. Then you all go to Amazon, all right? All six of you go to Amazon. In Amazon, you try to buy something, and you put that in your cart. I have a very simple question to ask you: Is the cart yours or is cart Amazon's? When I use it, it's mine. Then it's object. When it was with Amazon, it was in class. But when I rent it, it's mine. So it's an object. No, you didn't go to Amazon store, right? It is a web web website, right? Yeah, but I ordered it. I got it. So, so you all agree that <laughs> you all agree that before you try to buy that, it used to be there. Yes. There used to be thing called cart there, right? Yes, sir. The moment you click on something to purchase, the cart has created a specific cart for you. Correct? Yes, sir. In the physical world, when you go to a retail shop, the cart is there in the shop, right? Mm -hmm. If you if you hold it and you are using it for your transaction, it is your cart because you kept your 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 purchases in the cart. The moment you finish purchases and you've taken your goods and you abandon the card and somebody else picks up, would it remain your card or would it be going to a third card? It will become third person's card. It becomes his card. Mm -hmm. But if it is sitting there in the lane, in the cart lane, or in the vehicle, would you call it a card? The object, card, the class. It's in uh, class, sir. If you have a class. Correct. Same thing you apply, you go to Amazon. If you click, it remains there, it is class. Yes, sir. The moment each of you click, it created something. It's a virtual world, right? It's a virtual world. There is only one card, zero card there. But when you when you clicked on something, it it transformed itself into, it took a, it it created a copy of itself and it said this is your copy correct and it gave a copy to jacob it gave the copy to mukta it gave to dr krishna it gave palladi vishti each of you right yes. right so now that means what is that is doing what is that is doing it is created because it's a virtual world. It is 
there is a physical object. That means if there are hundred cars in Amazon, uh, uh, in let's say Walmart, there are hundred and fifty people who went. Fifty people will go with no car, isn't it? Hundred people will have cars and fifty people will go have no car. Is it fair? Is it correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sir. If 150 people go into Amazon, would 150 people get Amazon cards or only 100 people will get Amazon cards? Depends who wants to shop. No, no, all of them are shopping. Assume that all of them are shopping. Then all of them will get the cards. All of them. So that means in a virtual world, when it is converting itself into something, that means it is creating copies of itself, it is called instance. It is creating instances of itself. Right? Creating instances of itself. Creating instances of itself. So, virtual world is about creating instances. Physical world, it is pre-created instances. That means it cannot grow. 100 means 100, it will remain 100. There are no babies to cast there. Whereas in virtual world, you have actually one blueprint and that blueprint is creating several instances of cards. And when is it card? Only when you put an object in that, it is card. That means you purchase one item, you create a card. If you don't purchase one item, there is no card for you. So that's why somebody said depends. Correct? They said depends because they know that only if I purchase or if I select something, it becomes a card for me. It becomes my card. Otherwise, it's not a card. Yeah. So in a way that is called instant creating. I am creating an instance for someone. I am creating instance for somebody's use. When it is a creating instance, it is getting used. Therefore, in a virtual world or software world, the entire paradigm is defined as when in use, it is an object. When it's a class gets instantaneous instantiated as an object. A class converts itself into an object where it is in use. That clarity you should have. Now you guys are sitting in this class. What are you? You are an object or something else? At this point in time, you are an object? You are an object or no? You are, you have, you have mentally, yes, you are object. Because you are mentally instantiated the student object in your head. You are not playing fun object, you are not playing, uh, let's say, friend object. I am sure you are not playing any of these things. You are playing a student object. Is that fair or I might be digital, I mean, I am in illusion that you are playing that role. Right, I am in illusion, is it? Trini, it's night, you are dreaming, we are not students, we are not listening to you. <laughs> Only one person is categorically saying that I am not having any illusions. So, what is this nature? What are you then? Are you what? Are you a person? Are you a student? Are you a daughter? What are you? What are you? No, but you, you, after this class, you are somebody else, right? So in a way, if you look at yourself, you are really a class. But you are transforming yourself to the student object at this point in time. The moment this class is over, you will transform back yourself into some other object. So you are creating series of objects of yourself on a daily. Only when you are sleeping, you are someone else. You are a class. Otherwise, you are daily using yourself in various roles. So when you are using yourself in various roles, right? Yes, when you are using yourself in your roles, you are becoming an object. You are instantiating yourself into student form. You are instantiating yourself into a daughter form. So your daughter only when your parents are around. You are a sister when your, your, your siblings are around. You are a friend when your friends are around. It is con you are becoming context-oriented object. Is that fair enough to say? Yes, sir. 
critical. So that means when you are in use as a friend, you are a friend. When you are in use as a student, you are a student. Is this correct? Yes. That's correct. So, you, uh, so now you think like that. This is the simplest way to understand. I am a class, but I instant in I instant in instant shape a student in me in the class. I am a I am a class. I instant a friend object when I am with friends. So you are taking the role. Just understand your role yeah. as nothing but a object form of yourself. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So when you are object form, what happens? If you are in a friend role at this point in time, you behave like a friend or you behave like a boss or you behave like a student. How do you behave? As a friend, sir. So you, you bring the context. When you bring the context, it means that you have memories of being a friend. You have memories of behavior. Correct? Your behavior, that means operations, and the data that you have to carry with your friend is the data that is related to the friend data. Correct? Yes, sir. When you come to this class, your behavior is your operations. You have made your operations to listen, ask questions, seek understanding. That's the kind of operations you are using. And the data that you are having in your brain is the data that is relevant to the class. Yes, sir. This class. Right? Yeah. So the objects exactly do the same thing. Based on the context, they get the they fetch the data and based on context they use the operations in software as well. Now let's go a little deeper into this concept. I'm sure now if there's a lot more clarity in your head about object and class. I can assure you that. But let's look at the features there. In procedure world, the focus is on steps. In object world, the focus is on the data. How is the data? If I shift in your brain right now instead of class data, I put some other data, you cannot concentrate in the class. Let's say if I put the travel data in your head right now, you're totally in a different mood and then into a different shape because your data is not in sync with whatever you are listening. Therefore, you cannot understand. So, in in object world, data defines the context. Therefore, data defines the usage. Therefore, data defines the object. Is that clear? Yes, sir. A program is nothing but series of objects talking to each other. Do you agree with that? When you are seeing the program, do we see data all the while how it is getting processed or it is hidden from you? Let's say Allah is buying something and Srini is buying something, can Srini access what Pallavi is buying by by going to her object and seeing it? By going to her cart and seeing it? Can I do it? No, sir. Sitting here? No. That means the programs are objects. These objects are getting used at different stages. And the data within these objects are not able to be anybody else other than the person who is working on it. Otherwise, nobody else can see data. So that is called data abstraction. I am hiding data from all the people. Okay. I am also hiding the data from yourself. Whatever data you enter, it will save the data, but it saves the data through operation. So operation is what you see. That means action and function is what you see. Yeah. The that data is, is always hidden. Yeah. Right? Yes. The next one that you need to see is, these objects, that means this stock or item object that I purchased, is going and interacting with the thought object. Thought object. It says, Pallavi has purchased me, so now I go and then sit in you, therefore you become my car, Pallavi's car. 
So it is interacting with this object, correct? The data, each object that is there in the program are interacting with each other. Is that correct? How do they interact? They interact with somebody saying, hey, how do you say hello? If I say hello, if you don't respond to my hello, there is no conversation. Is that correct? Or there is no communication. Then I am a radio, you are a listener. But if it is communication, I am communicating something and you are receiving something. Right? If I am, if you are receiving something, that means I have an antenna and you have a receiver. Is that correct? What is an antenna and what is a receiver? Antenna is a method and receiver is a method. Receiver is a receiving method, antenna is sending method. So, objects communicate with each other as receiving and sending methods. Is that clear? Yeah. Objects communicate through methods. These methods use operations to perform actions or perform data operations on that. That means, if you want to modify data, you perform operations on the data. You are understanding what I am saying? If I spoke in English, you are able to understand it. I got a phone call about one hour back and I spoke in Telugu. You did not understand what I spoke, right? Any of you understood what I spoke? Yes. Nobody. Maybe somebody who knew Telugu, yes. <laughs> All other people would have to be wondering what this fellow is talking. Right? So, in a way, your object, after you receive the message from me, you interpret that data to say, this fellow is talking some nonsense, some gibberish. That is one process somebody is doing. Another process, this fellow is talking in familiar language. Let me open that and then translate it to so that familiar language object in your head. So this, this is what he spoke. So in a way, what is happening is, once the method has received the data, operation you call is language operation and interpret it. Right? After you received it, for you there is no value. What he spoke to someone, you know, some user thing he spoke, so let me reject it. Let me drop it. Oh man, he's talking about something important about Prime Minister Mahamodi. Let me store this, it is useful for me. He's talking about some exam that is important for me. He's talking about some job important for me. So you will register it. You will register what you like, you will reject what you don't like. That's what happens. So roughly what is happening is objects communicate with each other. There are methods that are helping each other to communicate. One is receiving and one is issuing data. And when the data has come, somebody has to operate on it. Is that clear? To make sense out of the data. So you have now clarity about data, objects having data, objects transmitting data through methods, methods call upon operations which will operate on the data. Is that clear? Because you have this object, in object world it is easy to add another object, another data to that. In object world it is easy to add another operation to it. Right? You understood that statement? In object, to an object you can add additional data, additional operation. For example, in your car, you can put additional seeds, baby seed, you can put perfume, you can add additional, additional stuff, right? Yes. And you can also add additional functions. For example, you can have a new watch, you can have a new music system. You can add additional woofers, all these things have additional stuff, yeah, additional. and then you can use that. So, similarly, as a human being, you can add additional language, additional knowledge. For example, you know three languages, you can learn another language, right? You can have fourth language, you can have fifth language, you can learn another IT program, you might learn another domain. All these things are something you can keep adding. So, objects inherently are capable of adding more and more. Whereas in procedural world, Adding new new functions become very very difficult because the, the operation keeps just bloating. Each program will become one lakh, two lakh lines, and it is difficult to maintain as they grow. Remember, if you're writing an essay, 
If you are writing every day something, will the, will the book become bigger and bigger every day? Now if you have to search your experience of 2002, January 2nd, what did you do? You have to go through that entire diary to find out where you have written that and then you have to get that information from there. Right? Yes. But if you wrote the diary as different, different years, different days, different, different months, different days, you might have much easier way to find this. So in a way what I am trying to explain to you is, the data that you store has got a value for you. The way you retrieve and the way you use is important and that is retrieved and that is used depending upon the context you are laying in or the context you are settled in. So the object oriented programming uses these concepts in proper programming world. What are the three concepts that you learn here? The three concepts that you learn here is a class is collection of objects of similar type. Once a class is defined, a number of objects can be created which belong to that class. We learned this, correct? We said a cart is a cart. The moment people keep purchasing, it is creating as many cars as required. So it is nothing but a collection, correct? Okay. Data abstraction or encapsulation, what we said, abstraction is act of representing essential features. That means, you know that we have full of nerves in our body, but our hand does certain things. So, hand is abstracting all my thinking behind my hand, right? My nerves are abstracting it. The data that goes in my brain, my brain does certain things based on which my hand works. So it's an abstraction, right? Yes. So abstraction hides the complexity behind it and shows only one thing. For example, if you say save, in application you say save, in application you say purchase, in application you say pay, the action behind it is abstracted from you, it's doing something. It takes the data, it goes to the bank, it detects the money, then puts it, all those things are abstracted. The user would see that it's the pay function, that's it, correct? What is encapsulation? Encapsulation is about making sure the data and the function that belongs to the data as a single unit. That means if I throw a ball at you, my hand will catch. If I give the ball to you, my hand will hold it. Right? So I have it's the same hand using two different functions for the same ball, depending upon how I receive the data about what is happening with the ball. When somebody threw it, I caught it. Because the data related to catch is when somebody throws at you, you catch it. If the data related to it, somebody gave you politely, you hold it. Because data and the function is for the data called hold, the function called hold is also called. So it's not encapsulated. So data and function usually go hand in hand in most of the situations. The moment I purchase something, cart is created. Data and function is together. Selection, this means cart creation. Selection of something means some object or some, some, some item I purchased. I item I decided to select means Item goes into the cart and the cart is created. It's encapsulated. You are clear about what I said? Yes, sir. You understand inheritance? Inheritance we discussed from this point. Car, BMW inherits car features. Car inherits BMW S1 inherits BMW features. Amukta car will inherit if it is BMW, it will inherit BMW features. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So it's basically uh, the subset of uh, bigger uh, bigger data, is it right? It belongs to a class. Yeah, so yes. it's nothing but inheritance. Just like our parents, grandparents, they keep passing DNA. Okay. You define 
So the key thing is when you give requirements, it is for the designer to start thinking in terms of what is the common minimum things I would design that as a top level class. The next level common minimum things I design as a next level class and I utilize both these things in the lowest object as hierarchies. That means I inherit those functions at the lowest level as well. So those are, these are the basic features which, which get inherited, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. So basically common, what you feel as common things, you keep it at the top. Okay. Polymorphism. Polymorphism is an interesting concept. I was talking about hand, right? The hand displays two different functions depending upon what you threw at it, right? Okay. So, so it is for us that these we can be a daughter sometimes, sister, or correct. Uh, you are exhibiting polymorphism. You are exhibiting polymorphism, okay. definitely, right? So same thing in software also. You can use a polymorphism. The difference is. You are exhibiting, your name is same, mm -hmm. right? Your name is same, but you are exhibiting as a daughter, you are a Pallavi daughter or you are a Pallavi sister, right? Yes, sir. Who is yes. speaking, by the way? I'm sorry, I'm using always Pallavi. Sorry, oh. Pallavi. <laughs> <laughs> Pallavi only. Pallavi only. Pallavi only, yeah. okay. <laughs> For some reason, I'm using it. Okay. Ah, roles are different, the same person is same, correct. So in software world also, I use this account. You see this account? Account with three values, account with four values will do the same thing for me. For example, when I say account with four values, it adds four, four values. Account with three values, it adds three values. This concept where I keep adding new, new variables, that means I give five variables here, I give six variables here. So these three things that I am putting here is variables. If I increase, keep increasing more and more variables, it can behave differently. It can behave differently. Mm -hmm. This method of adding more and more is called overloading. I am overloading the same object. I am loading with one. Here it's supposed to be three. I am loading with more objects, four, more variables, five, more variables, six. So. When I am overloading with more data and calling the same function name, that is called polymorphism exhibited by overloading of more variables. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If I do the other way, that is, instead of giving this 567, which is member, I give a name. Right? If I give a name, so I change the type of data there. Instead of number data, I give character data or name data. So now it will say account screen name means it will go on and fetch what is account screen name. So I am still calling the same name, but because I give different data, it will behave differently. So here it is called overriding. I have used a different data type, therefore it is overriding. So polymorphism exhibited by different data type is called overriding. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So I think we have a sense of what object means, what class means in the state. So whenever somebody talks about class and object, you have much better understanding at this point in time. Right? So what I suggest is go through some of this, some of this uh, stuff tomorrow. You please read this. We can have intelligence conversation tomorrow. But we'll capture this part tomorrow. We'll discuss about this part tomorrow.